Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Easter. This is April 18th, 2021. Wow. We've been functioning in the midst of a pandemic for a full year. It's amazing. I am thrilled to have been reappointed to Edge Hill for the next appointment year. Your confidence in me is humbling, and I'm excited about this fresh start we're going to have when we begin to regather in person. Don't forget about our Christ in Crisis series during the Sunday School Hour at 9.30. It's an excellent book that speaks to contemporary problems and misalignments that we all deal with. The link was included in today's email. Today's reading is a perfect reading for a communion service, so we will be celebrating communion toward the end of the sermon. I invite you to stop the service now, gather your bread and your cup if you haven't yet, so you're prepared and receive communion with the rest of the congregation in the service. Now, on this third Sunday in Easter, let's prepare our hearts and our minds to worship together. <laughs> uh, so I invite you now to open up your hearts and your minds, recognize each other's presence, no matter where we are, and let the Holy Spirit work through John Lee Hughes. Good morning, Edge Hill. Will you join me now for our call to worship? O oh God, on the road to Emmaus, the risen Christ revealed himself to the disciples in the breaking of bread. Feed us with the bread of life. Break open our hearts that we may see Christ, not only in the good news of the scriptures, but risen in the midst of your pilgrim people.
Jesus, you surprise us with empty graves and strange appearances. You can imagine our confusion at your turning the world upside down. We confess that though you have sent us out as your disciples, we forget the reason for our mission. We grow tired with overwork. We impose ourselves on others. Teach us to wander and wonder with you because more is going on than meets the eye. Open our lives to receive you in the stranger, in the new, in the past, in the bread, in the cup, in all that we do, wherever we are, so that all might share in your love. Amen. The peace of God be with you. Receive God's forgiveness and the promise of the Spirit, for Jesus is risen from the dead. Seen or unseen, he is present in our midst, and we see the presence of Christ reflected in each other's faces. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we ask that you open our eyes to the abundance of your creative love in all that surrounds us and all that sustains us. Enable us to become people of hope and life. Allow us to surrender to your love, especially during times of trouble and heartache. Let us be the people who nurture and nourish one another on this earthly journey so we can be co-creators with you in a more just and loving world. Fill us with your gentle love that we may walk tenderly on this earth. Empower us to reimagine Jesus' ancient teachings as we live in the chaos of our modern world. And be with all of those impacted by the global pandemic in which we live, especially our seniors and those tasked with caring for them. 
and those living in poverty and those who've lost their employment and their income. May we all move toward a place of sustainability and safety quickly. Give each of us the patience we need to keep moving forward, following you in our journey, our journey toward wholeness, and most importantly, our journey toward hopefulness. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There is good news this morning. Luke 24, 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, They came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. 
Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were our hearts not burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Joyful Word of God for the People of God Don't you wonder, what do you think keeps the two discouraged disciples from recognizing Jesus Christ that entire day that they traveled together? Luke says that they were kept from recognizing him. So it sounds like Luke wants us to believe that God shielded their eyes, kept them from seeing. But why? Certainly not to make a more dramatic story. I don't think God would do that. You know, maybe another more practical reason would have been that they were too caught up in their own grief, in their own sadness. And they were distracted by the huge disappointment in their lives. And they simply couldn't see Jesus standing right there in front of them as they walked and they talked. And they shared everything they had seen. I think this is something that we can relate to more than blaming God for our spiritual blindness. The disciples were distraught. They were sad. They were disappointed. The man they'd loved and followed had died a gruesome death. And they walked and they talked and they remembered. But in the midst of their conversations, a stranger approached them and asked them an extremely loaded question. He asks, hey, what are you talking about? Of course, given the previous couple of weeks, this opens a door for them to retell the entire Jesus story so that the risen Christ can connect those stories that they just told to the ancient prophecies spelled out in the Hebrew scriptures. And in doing so, they began to better understand the depth of God's love. They began to understand the connection between the crucified Christ and the risen Christ. But they still didn't make the connection between the risen Christ and this person that was standing right there in front of them. It's remarkable. I think this is why. In them telling the Jesus story, the disciples uttered a few words of disappointment that are universally recognizable. I mean, recognizable to all of us. Those words were simply, we had hoped. Clearly, they were devastated by the death of Jesus. Verse 21 says, but we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. But we had hoped. Think about those four words. They speak of a future that's not going to happen. They speak to a future that now seems meaningless because the door's closed, it's over. But we had hoped. I read that Ernest Hemingway once accepted a challenge to write a short story in only six words. The myth goes that he replied by writing on a napkin, for sale, baby shoes, never used. There are few things worse than hope being crushed. And it's not just the sadness that hurts. 
but it's the void created by all that could have happened, the lost opportunities, the lost dreams that cause us grief and suffering. And that's where the disciples were on that day. And it's where many of us are today in the shadow of a year of the coronavirus. It's during these times of disappointment in our lives that we can become the most open to a spiritual awakening in our lives, to a mystical experience. It's when we most need to experience God's love when we're crushed and broken. Edge Hill as a congregation still longs to be together. The distance has strained our relationships and we all have people whose families have been impacted by the virus. And on top of that, we love an entire neighborhood of people trapped in concentrated poverty for whom lost hope has become a way of life. Hearing, reading, and knowing about God's love, it's important, but it doesn't seem to help much because God's love must truly be experienced for true transformation to happen. And that's what's happening in this climactic finish in today's story, as Jesus hosted the meal on this road to Emmaus, and their entire universe shifted. They were changed, and now they were filled with hope and joy. Verse 31 reads, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they immediately recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. What follows here is fascinating. The men were then able to look back on that experience, what had happened that day, and they see that Christ was with them the entire time. They said, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? But we had hoped. There's more, of course. There's always more. We have so much in this life that is beautiful, daring, inspiring, and life-giving. The countless things that deserve our gratitude. But life also includes disappointments, heartbreak, and loss. The things that we in our culture often spend very little time processing together. Jesus asked them what they were talking about. And he listened. And he saw they did not quite understand the complete story, at least not yet. As a congregation, we also must continue to create the space for people to know and to be known to trust and to be trusted, to listen, to learn, and speak. And they must be welcomed at the table where everyone has a place. And that's what we do as Easter people. We sound the loving message of the resurrection and we break bread with the brokenhearted. But after a year, it's fair to ask, when? When will we be able to break bread together in person, in our communion circle. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be pushing for us to regather for worship at Pentecost this year so that we can count on the Holy Spirit to move us toward our new future together. The disciples in today's story, they were changed through the sacrament of Holy Communion. It's when they recognized the stranger was indeed the risen Christ. What a powerfully memorable moment that is actually equally accessible to us as it, is to, as it was to the disciples. So as we gather in front of our screens, isolated and probably still anxious, let's recognize that the God of love is with us as we worship and remember these stories and our stories because the disciples remembered the stories as they told the stranger what had happened. Isn't it interesting that even during Jesus' teachings, the disciples still didn't recognize who he was, but they certainly listened to what he said, and they invited him to stay and share a meal with them before they departed ways.
It was here that Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said something along the lines of, take, eat. This is God's love that's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they did. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He again gave thanks and offered it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my love of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we say to God, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, regardless of where we are, at home or at 1502 Edge Hill Avenue, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Ever-present God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us watching and participating in this service and on these gifts of bread and cup. Reveal through these gifts the Spirit of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ. Living lives filled with love and mutuality so that this relational movement of love continues to welcome the lost, the least, and the left out. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry with all the world. Amen. This is the body of Christ and the cup of salvation given and poured out for you. Amen.